discipleship is simple. What we wanted to achieve in going through this um, curriculum, this lesson, this series, is to be able to explain to us that discipleship is simple. Um, how many of you know simple and easy are not necessarily the same thing, but discipleship, according to Scripture, is simple. Acts chapter 4, verse 13 talks about Jesus having disciples who were ordinary, unschooled people. These were, um, these were fishermen, people who were ordinary people, and yet they, God used them to turn the world upside down or right side up. And so the four weeks, four week series that we started three weeks ago, Pastor Patrick started, the Lord, the lost, and the church next week, the journey, which means uh, discipleship is following the Lord, following Jesus, and reaching out, connecting people to Jesus, the lost, those many of us at some point uh, years ago, some of you a few months ago, some of you just pretty recent, you've given your life to Christ. We were lost apart from a relationship with Jesus Christ. And then today we're going to talk about the church. This is the environment. This is the community. This is the spiritual family that God has connected us with. That's the church. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. Now, earlier Pastor Miko talked about uh, dogs and those of you who have dogs. Yesterday I learned something about goldfish. I don't know if uh, any goldfish lover, lovers are here, okay? But um, when you talk about gold, I, this is something that I, I just learned recently because, you know, whether that's goldfish or I've, I've heard other versions like, let's say, shark, when you put certain animals in a tank, it'll depend on the size and whatever size the tank is, that's how big they'll grow. I don't know if you've heard that. Well, for the goldfish, I've always thought this was the case. If it's a bigger tank, it'll be a bigger goldfish. If it's just a small fish bowl, it'll remain small. And uh, that myth was busted for me last night when I was searching the internet. And how many of you know everything's true on the internet? <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but this one is certified, okay? So the guy who was writing said, you know, it's really not the size of the bowl. The thing with this, it's because of full, uh, poor filtration and poor water conditions because, you know, a fish bowl is not really the best environment. You know, a, a bigger uh, uh, tank would mean, you know, again, he talked a lot about technical stuff. After he started giving technical stuff, my mind just shut down, okay? Uh, and so, but... Basically, uh, poor and uh, quality of water and improper care. That's what would cause the stunting of the growth of the goldfish. But if you take care of it better, then it's going to grow bigger. Um, and, and so, again, I, I learned that. And I think about not just the goldfish, but the church. If we are in an environment that is healthy, and later we'll talk about that in Ephesians chapter 4, God shows us what is the environment that we should live in and we should be in so that our faith will continue to grow? Because we don't want, want to be, you know, uh, our, our growth, even our personal growth, to be stunted or even as a body. The Bible talks about the church as the body of Christ, likens itself to a body. How many of you know that the church is, the body, is a body, not a building? Usually, as I said, I'm usually in the 11 o'clock a.m. at the building here in Treston because of the overflow in the morning services here. Pastor Patrick is also in Treston at the 3 p.m. And so I was explaining this morning at the Treston building, while we are in a school building, and this is not a te technically quote-unquote church, but the church meets here. Because the church is not the building, the church is the people. Okay, look at the person beside you. Tell them he's talking about you. All right? And so this is the church. You are the church. We are the church. And so God wants the church to grow. God wants to, his body to grow and, and to be in an environment where it's healthy. We don't want to be, you know, I don't know if you've ever seen some of those guys who are so muscular on the top, but they have chicken legs. You know what I mean? Like they're strong and they look really buffed on the outside, uh, the upper part, but it's just really thin down here. 
or you don't, you know, I, like this picture right there, okay? You don't want to have a big muscles here and then the other muscle, uh, the other bicep uh, is not really as large or you have this big ear and your other ear is, as, you know, half the size of the other one. And so we want the church to grow. We want the body of Christ to grow. And so the Bible gives us a, how do you call this? A concept of perfecting or perfection, meaning uh, when the Bible talks about maturing, he use, it uses the other term perfection or being perfected. And there are three, and let me lay down some foundations here. I hope you don't sleep on me. But there are three foundations I want to talk about right now for, for just to lay foundations. Number one, the Bible talks about positional perfection. What does this mean? Positional perfection, the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 10, for by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who have, are being sanctified. What is the writer of Hebrews telling us? Meaning that you and I, in God's eyes, if you have relationship with Jesus and he is Lord and Savior and your, your, your heart's been cleansed by the, the, by the blood of Jesus and you know that you've been saved, not because of your good works, but because of what was what Jesus purchased for you in Calvary, God sees you as perfect. It's as if you've never sinned. That's what justification is. You've been justified. Jesus, by his sacrifices, atoning work, now God has taken our unrighteousness and placed it on Christ and His righteousness placed on us. That's what positional perfection is. Now, second thing is the ultimate perfection that one day you and I will be, you know, mature, complete, not lacking in anything as James chapter 1 says. Not that I've already obtained this, Philippians 3 says, or am already perfect. In other words, what he's saying, I will get there. There will be an ultimate perfection, God's sanctifying me, God's changing me to become more like Jesus Christ. How many of you understand what this thought and concept is, that you're being changed? How many of you are still being changed, right? God's still transforming us. What He started, Philippians 1.6, He will complete. Third one is the experiential perfection. What does this mean? Experiential perfection is... Bible says, and this is our text for today, Ephesians 4, he gave some apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the, this is the King James Version, the perfecting of the saints. Meaning there's a process. There's a change, a transformation, a renewing work that God is doing in our lives. We're not yet perfect. We're not, you know, we're not there yet. He's still changing us, transforming us. But there's a design. If, if, you, if you can think of, a, of, of, of let's say, a, a, a cookie cutter or even just, a, a, you know, uh, let's say a, a design. There's a, like, a design that you're copying and then, you know, you are being shaped and formed to match that design. There's a design God has purposed for us. We, we are being transformed. Now, that brings us to Ephesians chapter 4. And we're going to read scripture together. If you're there on your gadgets, in your Bibles, I'm going to ask you to stand up. We're going to read the Bible together. Um, I usually ask this whenever uh, in, our, in our services. I, I want us to stand to honor the Word of God. God's Word is the Bible. Do you guys love the Bible? I hope you love the Bible. I hope you love God's Word. God's Word gives us wisdom. It doesn't just give you tweetable quotes on Instagram. It's, it's for the changing and transforming of our lives. Ephesians chapter 4. I'm reading from ESV, verse 11 says, And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the shepherds, and the teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood and to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children. NIV translates that as no longer infants. Tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness in deceitful schemes. Verse 15, rather speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ. For whom 
the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped when each part is working properly makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Because your word is powerful and effective, as the Bible says, Lord, and it is sharper than a double-edged sword. And thank you, God, that your word is able to bring, yes, insight and inspiration, but more than just that, thank you, Lord, that it will equip us and, and recalibrate our minds to think the right way, to be able to understand what it really means. And he, specifically in our topic tonight, as we talk about the church, as we talk about fellowship, Lord, let us understand what the church community is and the environment by which you've placed us in so that we can grow. And as the Bible says in Ephesians, the body will be built up. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may go and have a seat. Paul's speaking to the church in Ephesus. And in verse 11, he talks about God's raising different men Full-time ministers, if you could say, if you, if you could let me use that, like the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds or the pastors, and the teachers. And he says they're to equip the saints for the work of ministry. Now, when he talks about saints here, he's, he's talking about, you know, uh, live people, all right? He's talking to the church, uh, people who are alive and people who are walking and living for Christ. And, and, and so, you know, usually it's, it's hard for us to accept, you know, I, I'm, how many of you here, you believe you're a saint? Raise your hand. That's hard, right? When you ask, I, I'm a saint. No, but, well, but the Bible says, if you are bought by the blood of Jesus, if you have been cleansed by his righteousness, then the Bible says you've been set apart in his holiness, not by your personal works, but by the work of Christ and the cross, then you are a saint. So by that definition, how many of you, you're a saint? By all of us, right? So that's Saint Fidel, Saint Miko, Saint Bernard, okay? <laughs> and so all of you here, okay? And so if you, have, uh, if you, if you are a, 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 you know, a person who has submitted your life to Christ. Now, Bible says to equip. That's the job of the full-time minister. The pastor, Pastor Patrick. His role is not to do all the works of ministry his role is to equip, who are the saints? You, okay? Look at the person beside you. Tell him, he's talking about you again. That's right. So every single one of you, God has called to be equipped by the full-time minister so that you can do works of ministry. I was so grateful for people who just recently spoke to me and, and said, you know, I'm, I'm doing this. We have a guy in our small group. Uh, what they do, a man and a husband and wife, they bought small, they came from the States and they relocated here. Be, they felt a call from God to actually help the nation. So they started small businesses from junk shops to sari sari stores, several to bring about livelihood for the people in the certain communities that they're in. And so I thought, wow, that's their ministry. And God is equipping them. And so equip the saints for work of ministry. Now, sometimes... Unfortunately, the work, or rather the church, looks like a basketball arena. This is the Oracle Arena. How many of you here are Golden State Warrior fans right now? Okay. Um, and so they're pretty famous these days because they're really doing so well. But not wasn't like that a few years ago. But now, if you look at the Oracle Arena, this is, you know, again, Golden State Warriors Arena. It could... Seat about 20,000 people in that one stadium. And so there's 20,000 people in yellow shirts, okay, and watching 10 guys playing on the basketball court, five on one side each, right? And so 10 men who are tired and doing all they can to get the basketball and shoot it in their own hoop, Ten men who are tired and badly needing rest with 20,000 people watching badly needing exercise. And so sometimes that becomes the picture of the church. There's just one guy or a few guys doing the professional, quote-unquote, work of ministry. And everybody else just sits and watches. And, okay, you know, I'm giving my tithes and offerings anyway. And so you just go work. 
I'm just so grateful for a thousand plus victory group leaders that we have here that serve, that minister. It doesn't have to be the pastor to, you know, uh, go, let's say, uh, somebody sick in the, in the hospital. It's the, the victory group leaders are empowered to go, to pray for the sick, to believe God. Listen, you know, people, sometimes people call me, Pastor Paulo, could you come to our office and be the one to share the gospel to our office? Well, you know, that's wonderful. But I ask them, do you have Jesus in your heart? Yeah. Do you, have, have you given your life to Christ? Yes. Do you understand what the gospel is? Yes. Then if you understand what the gospel is, then you can go share your, the gospel to you. To, to, to your office mates. Because they have the Holy Spirit just like I have the Holy Spirit. How many of you understand what I'm talking about? So which means there's no senior Holy Spirit because I'm the pastor and there's the junior Holy Spirit because hey, victory group leader. Ka lang eh. <laughs> right? There, there's no distinction. There's a, there's a, you know, the first level Holy Spirit and the second level Holy Spirit. The second class citizen in the church. There's no such thing like that. And so God's called everyone to be equipped. Let me tell you about Luis. Luis is a, a pastor, Ariel Marquez, of our church in Alabang. I talked about him recently. Um, and so he, Luis was one who, you know, again, long story short, was one who lived a life away from Christ and um, everything that was supposed from Scripture, from getting drunk to just stuff, all right? And then... Um, relationship, uh, extramarital relationship, and one after the other. And so, came to a point that his wife actually um, threw him in jail. <laughs> and so, for three, several months, I think, uh, he was in jail and he, he, he had a picture. Uh, the, guy, the, the pictures on top was the one when he was in jail, all right? And so, that's his cell group, right? <laughs> that's his cell ministry group, <laughs> literally. Okay, the one in the bottom, that's his family already. And he was just actually making a distinction between how God changed him from then to now. And so now, fortunately and, and amazingly, somebody shared the gospel to him. Gay, he gave his life to Christ. He went through discipleship. He, you know, allowed somebody to speak into his life. He grew consistently until, you know, now he's sharing his, he's sharing his faith to his sister all right, and then sharing his faith to his barkada. All right, you've heard of God turning water into wine. They turned wine into water, okay? <laughs> no longer are they drinking, and they're no longer getting drunk. They're no longer, all right, just all these things. And so it changed. And guess what? Not only did he share the gospel with them, now all those guys are in church. The same barkada he has brought to church. They have a small group. Come on, give the Lord a hand for that. You know what? The one who shared with him wasn't even a pastor. One who brought him to church did want to, not even a pastor. But God, God used people in his life. God uses the pastors to equip the people to, the, to do the works of ministry. Verse 13. The Bible says, until we all attain to the unity of the faith... And of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature. There's the word again. So that we can mature, get, you know, uh, uh, to bring us into growth and maturity. And then verse 14, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves, by every doctrine that comes. Remember years ago when, you know, when Da Vinci Code came out and people started to uh, doubt the inerrancy of the Word of God. The Word of God does not just contain, uh, the Bible doesn't just contain the Word of God. It is the Word of God. It is inerrant. And so, you know, by a fictional book, people's minds have become shaken. Our faith has been shaken. Or even the Gospel of Judas, when that came out, which actually was written 100 plus years after Jesus, wasn't even written by Judas himself. And it started to shake people's faith. Or maybe... You know, even Bibles, there are certain Bible scholars today that say, you know, Moses didn't really, together with the Israelites, go through Red Sea on dry ground, as Exodus chapter 14 says. They went through, you know, knee deep water, only knee deep water, because it's impossible for the, you know, Red Sea to do that. Maybe it was just low tide. 
And, you know, of course, that's exactly why it's a miracle, right? And so they couldn't believe. And so maybe it's just knee-high water. It was low tide. Now, how many of you know it's even a greater miracle? Why? If it were so, if it were even true that it was just knee-high, it would have been even a greater miracle because the Bible says that the Egyptians and the horses got drowned on the Red Sea. (laughs) How many of you know that's hard to get drowned on knee-high water? Now, Let's look at the scriptures. When you talk about the Bible, or when you talk about the church rather, in scripture, there's three things I want to talk about. Authenticity, unity, and responsibility. Let's talk about authenticity. Bible says in verse 15, rather, speak the truth in love. We are to grow up. When we speak the truth in love, we grow up. You know, Paul understands this because when he, there was one time that he addressed Peter. Spoke to Peter and said, you know, why are you, you know, when, when, when the Judaizers came, I, I don't know if you've heard this story in, in the New Testament. Judaizers, not, Judaizers, not the followers of Judai, okay. But the Judaizers are those who were um, the Pharisees and the Jews that, I guess, they said you can be saved through grace, but you have to add works with grace. And so while he was eating with the Gentiles, Peter, uh, the Judaizers came. And so he was afraid that that he would be persecuted. So he stood up and changed tables with another and started eating with these. And so the Bible says Paul rebuked Peter to his face. And so there are moments that you and I, how many of you, I don't know if you have people in your lives that can speak to you. And it will call you out if you're out of line. And that's hard. Because the Bible says, as iron sharpens another, so does one man sharpen another man. And when iron will sharpen another, how many of you know there's friction? Sparks will fly. And it's normally things that we don't want to hear. Bible says in Proverbs, wounds from a friend are better than kisses from the enemy. That open rebuke is better than hidden love. Do you have people like that? In, I'm, I'm sure Peter later on repented and he was glad he had a Paul in his life. Do you have people like that? I'm grateful. That I have people, I, mean, I grew up in a single parent home. I did not know what it meant to be a father. I'm so glad somebody spoke to me and said, this is what it means to be a dad. I remember Pastor Steve, I was, uh, our eldest was still very young at that time. I think about two or three years old and he was running around church. And he spoke to me and said, you know, Paolo, you're a great dad. Sandwich approach, right? You're a great dad. But you know, you're so tolerant. You just let your son run around. It, it seems like this is just a play place. This is a place of worship. Don't let your son just run around. But you're a great dad. <laughs> I'm glad somebody had courage to speak into my life. And there was one time Pastor Manny Carla spoke to me and said, you know, when you said that statement, it seemed like it was a negative derogatory remark that discredits another leader. I will not, we, we cannot have something like that going on in our organization, in our church. And he called me out. I'm glad I have people like that in my life. Because if you, if you those of you who play tennis or you play golf, your swing will not improve. If you don't listen to somebody who sees you from the outside, you may have blinds. We all, we all have blind spots. See, discipleship is simple but not easy because it requires authenticity. Number two, unity. Let's talk about unity. The Bible says, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped. Joined and held together. Everybody say together. You and I cannot fulfill the purposes of God apart from each other. You cannot fulfill God's destiny in your life apart from from the person beside you. That's right. Okay? I cannot fulfill my destiny apart from Fidel, Pastor Miko, Pastor Patrick. And they can't without me because God's joined us together and there is a reason why he's placed us together. Like the body, 
I mean, you think about your body. Imagine if your eye was under your armpit or just, there's a reason why God's placed you or, or, or placed the parts of your body where they are today. Your fingers are in your forehead. The boss like, it, it's an alien movie. There's a reason. And so you are where you are today because God has a purpose. And you cannot fulfill your destiny. Somebody said it this way, you can never be the best alone. You cannot be. You can never be the best that God has made you to be just by yourself. You cannot be the best alone. You need people. Joined and held together, the Bible says. You see, fellowship is not as we, not me. It's give, not get. It's others, not us. Let me explain that statement right there. We, not me. That's what community is. And sometimes what, hap- what has happened is that church has become about what is in it for me. I like it there because there's air con or, you know, the seats are comfortable or, or if, who, who's preaching? You know, do you know as people call in sometimes and ask, who's preaching today? Listen, it doesn't matter who's preaching as long as the word of God is preached. Even if it's a donkey who's preaching the word today. <laughs> Okay, I know the one that's on stage right now sounds like one or looks like one. But Numbers in the Bible, the book of Numbers talks about a donkey preaching the word of God. It doesn't matter who's preaching. And it's not just about what I can get. It's become consumer Christianity. It's not we. It's not what I can get. It's what I can give. It's not about us. It's about others. Did you know that the church is the only organization in the planet that exists for non-members? I think about it. Country clubs, you have to have a membership card. Fitness first or, you know, all these fitness clubs, you have to have a membership card. The church is the only organization that is open to non-members. Fascinating, isn't it? Fellowship is not, is we not me, Give, not get. Others, not just us. Let me wrap it up. Responsibility. Bible says in Ephesians 4.16. From whom the whole body joined and held together by every, every joint with which it is equipped. When each part is working properly makes the body grow. There it is again. You see the maturity, the growth, the perfecting. Each part is working together properly. And then so what happens? It builds itself up in love. When each part works together. And that's service. And again, I I appreciate all our ushers here. How many of you appreciate our ushers? Hope you appreciate our ushers. Our ushers here serve every single Sunday. I was telling the 6 p.m. Uh, service earlier. Hindi ko nakipapagalitan. Pinagalitan ko yung 6 p.m. kasi doon naman ako lagi. Eh. But I told him, sometimes you, you treat our ushers as if they're your own personal butlers. Don't treat them that way. They're volunteers just like everybody else in the church. They do it because they love God. And they, it's a worship service unto God. And so sometimes the way, you know, we, you know, minsan tinatarayan natin ushers, di ba? We're told not to go here or we're told to sit here. I want to go where I want to go. Balak sa buhay It's like, and so again, they're, they're serving. They, they love God. And it's not just the ushers. Our, our tech team back there, Sila Doc, just an amazing man who's served so many years. And our, 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 our camera people, our, our, our ushers, our everybody, kids church teachers, stage managers. When the body is serving, it works properly, and you see the body ultimately grows. You see, you cannot grow unless you're actually giving off yourself. Because I mean, it's, it's, you know that from fitness. We become, we become obese if we don't work or if we don't move our bodies, right? If we don't exercise. And so we become spiritually obese if we don't work out our spiritual gifts. You know, uh, talking about spiritual gifts <clears throat> years ago, and I'm going to ask the live stream to be cut. For, okay, thanks. 
um, because there's a, as a story I want to share with you, and it, because of security protocols, I, I'm going to have to cut the live stream. That's the benefit of being in church live, okay? God has given us gifts that we could use for His glory. And yes, it's a community of authenticity. Yes, it's a community that will foster unity. And listen, if you talk about unity, there will be times where that unity is going to be tested. It's not what happens to you that is important. It's how you respond to what happens to you. And so, Bible says, make every effort to keep the unity through the bond of peace. And so, and ultimately, there's a responsibility. And when we see this coming together, listen, it's inevitable. The church will eventually grow. Amen? And the kingdom of God will advance. Praise God. Let's, let's, let's bow our heads and pray. Father, thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your love. Thank you for the way that you have, Lord, blessed us in so many ways. And many of us here, Lord, Lord this evening, Lord, are amazed by the testimony. And we're grateful, Lord, for what you've done in their lives. And Lord, today we pray in the area of even in authenticity. Lord, I pray that we would continually be open to people who can speak into our lives and call out things and maybe even recalibrate us when we're out of line. Actually, I want to pray for some of you here today as you bow your heads and some of you have been offended. Listen, it's not what happens to us. It's how we respond. And surely maybe they're right. It's not the wrongness or the rightness of the situation. It's actually how you respond to it. And God's calling you out and saying, how will you respond to this offense? Will you harbor it? Will you nurse it like a wound? Or will you actually let God use it to grow character? And so Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus for those here this evening were maybe nurturing an offense, a church member or a friend or a, somebody who called them out, Lord, I pray that we would be humble enough to see or at least receive correction when necessary. And even if we don't see it, Lord, I pray, Lord, that we would hear. And when we hear it, Lord, let us Lord, take the necessary steps to see that change. And Lord, some of us, Lord, in the area of unity, Lord, help us to be able to pursue unity. Lord, making every effort to keep it. And then, and then Lord, in the area of responsibility for us to be able to continue to move forward and use our God-given gifts to serve God inspired purposes and so Lord thank you for our fellowship our community here Lord we pray that as we grow together we would continue to Lord reach out to friends and family members Lord who would desire a relationship with you they just don't know it yet that they too would come into a saving knowledge of Christ thank you Lord the name of Jesus. Can we all stand as we end? I pray tonight that tonight is, is an encouraging word for you. That God has placed us in a community, in a fellowship, in a, in a family like this. And there's a reason. And I pray that if you don't have a people that you walk with, whether that's a victory group or at least friends that you can pray with, I want to encourage you. Find people who can at least walk with you so that you can continue to grow in your faith. Amen? Lord, I pray that you would bless everyone as we leave today. May your righteousness, your peace, your joy go with us as we leave. We give you honor. We give you praise. And I pray, Lord, as we leave today, I pray that, Lord, we would have the best week ever. I ask, Lord, that you would bless the work of our hands. Bless, Lord, the work of everyone's hand here, Lord, uh, that the endeavors that they, Lord, get into, that you would be in it, 
Lord, not just invite you to be in it, that you actually would be in charge. You would be Lord of our offices and, and, and our campuses. You would be Lord of our lives and everything that we do. Lord, may you be first. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Somebody say amen. Amen. Let's give the Lord a hand. God bless you. Have a great week ahead.